Good evening. Today is October 25th, 2022, and welcome to the Behavioral Health Workforce Education and Training Interprofessional Integrated Health Education Series. This program is supported by the Health Resources and Services Administration, HRSA, of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, and our grant numbers are listed for your review. As a gentle reminder, uh, we do have our activity code listed. It does expire on October 26th, so please take a screenshot and we will also have this information at the end of the presentation. We will provide you with the website information as well as the text code. An overview of tonight's agenda, I am Dr. Katherine Y. Brown. I'll serve as your moderator. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Family and Community Medicine and also director of Communities of Practice and Dissemination at the National Center for Medical Education, Development and Research at Meharry Medical College. We will have a welcome by Mr. Ross Fleming III, Director of Behavioral Health Practice, Meharry Medical College, and our featured presenter, you all are in for a treat, is Dr. Andre L. Churchwell, Vice Chancellor of Outreach, Inclusion, and Belonging, Vanderbilt University. As a gentle reminder, please, Mute your microphones during the presentation. Use the chat box for questions and comments. At this time, we invite you for a virtual introduction. Please share your name, organization, city and state. And remember, Q&A will follow the presentation. Let's connect on social media. Be sure to use our hashtag, hashtag PCTCOP. For more information, our websites are listed. This is part of a collaboration between the Behavioral Health Workforce Education and Training Program, the Tennessee Area Health Education Center's TNAHEC program, the National Center for Medical Education Development and Research, and the College-Wide Patient-Centered Medical Home. We have listed our team members on the slides for your review. And at this time, I will transition the program over to Mr. Ross Fleming III, who will introduce our speaker. Thank you all. Thank you, Dr. Brown. This, um, the slides are acting kind of funny right now, like a ghost in it. It's Halloween already for slides. <laughs> so I'm going to go through it and not touch it. Uh, good evening and welcome to the uh, Behavioral Health Workforce Education Training Lecture Series. I am Ross Fleming. I am the Director of Behavioral Health Practice. And tonight's topic is that systems approach to manage COVID-19 care, COVID care inequities. This is being offered through a collaborative effort. Through an integrated health approach, the Departments of Psychiatry and Behavioral Health Sciences and Family and Community Medicine have collaborated with the Tennessee Area Education Centers to train residents, student scholars, and other health professionals to work and work with persons in rural, rural, vulnerable, and medically underserved communities. This approach will expand the number of behavioral health, family medicine, and other health professionals who will stay and work in primary care settings in Tennessee, as well in, as rural and medically underserved communities nationwide. Tonight, we have an opportunity to expand residents, student scholars, as well as others training as they hear from an expert in health equity. I hope you will listen and engage in this very important yes. topic tonight. Orlando, $120. Orlando, call you back. Our speaker tonight is Dr. Andre L. Churchwell. He is the Vice Chancellor of Outreach, Inclusion, and Belonging and Chief Diversity Officer at Vanderbilt University. He is the inaugural Levi Watkins Jr. MD, MD Chair and previously served as the Chief Diversity Officer for Vanderbilt University Medical Center and Senior Associate Dean for Diversity Affairs in the Vanderbilt University School of Medicine. Churchwell is a Professor of Medicine Cardiology, Professor of Radiology and Radiological Sciences, and Professor of Biomedical Engineering. 
In 2019, Churchill was appointed interim vice chancellor for equity, diversity, and inclusion, and chief diversity officer at Vanderbilt University. In addition to his roles at Vanderbilt Medical Center, Churchwell's interim appointment became a full-time permanent appointment in March, 2022. In September, 2020, 2022, Dr. Churchwell's role was expanded to include institutional belonging and community outreach. With this translation, Churchwell's position emphasizes the importance of promoting a sense of belonging among all students, faculty, staff, and postdoctoral scholars with the goal of enhance, uh, advancing human potential and growth. He works with all campus partners, senior leadership, students, faculty, staff, alumni, community, and the Board of Trust to fulfill the mission of promoting the campus environment that is affirming, welcoming, equitable, inclusive, and diverse in order to foster a sense of belonging at Vanderbilt and beyond with the goal of advancing human potential and growth. He is currently working with numerous campus partners to develop an institutional strategic plan, as well as the strategic plans within the college, school, and division. Dr. Churchill wholeheartedly believes that equity, diversity, and inclusion are inseparable from the institutional excellence and work tirelessly. He works tirelessly to ensure that Vanderbilt is transformative community that respects, values, and supports all people. Ladies and gentlemen, I introduce to you Dr. Andre L. Churchwell. Well, thank you. I hope everybody can hear me. Uh, can we get a thumbs up out there if you can hear me? Yes, you can see me too. That's great. Well, I really appreciate the opportunity to talk and to share with you uh, tonight. Uh, when Ross asked me to look at this uh, topic, it became clear to me that uh, this topic probably fit very nicely within the uh, confines of this whole program's approach about interprofessional work and how, how we do better as we work as teams and bringing our unique skills, whether it be nurses, pharmacists, physicians, nurse practitioners, and social uh, service and the whole like, because it's clear in the complexity of modern healthcare with patients having so many comorbid problems in their problem list patients having fairly advanced disease by the time they come to our medical centers and, and our hospital systems, we need a multidisciplinary approach. And so the systems approach to managing COVID-19 was a great idea, uh, was, was, a, was a great topic because I'm gonna lead you in kind of a real time sense about a, pro a problem that confronted Nashville uh, that required everybody to have hands on deck. I won't go into great detail, but no one had more hands on deck than James Hildreth, the president of Meharry, who literally became the voice of explaining COVID and COVID virology and COVID uh, immunology and immunotherapy, not just to Nashville, but to communities across this country and the world. So James's role was huge in this. I'm going to focus on what we at Vanderbilt Medical Center needed to do to recognize, to pivot on this. I will want to begin by acknowledging Patricia Juarez is in Paris, I understand, Paris, France. And if she's there, my best net cold for you is hold me close and hold me fast. <laughs> the magic spell you cast, they call love in rose. Back to work. There we go. So, <laughs> so that's a little tribute to her. Uh, next slide. I have no disclosures. I have a lot of knowledge, but nothing to acknowledge from a financial perspective. Next slide. Uh, back one. Whoop, you're, yeah, this, you're a very sensitive slide thing. Oh, oh, back, back. There, there you go. Why? So, you know, why do we have to have a systems approach to COVID? COVID was a unique uh, virus, coronavirus, uh, had not been present in the human condition. We think probably at this point it was zoonotic transmission from animals uh, in China to humans. We've seen that occur with bats and other animals. Uh, but why do we have to have this pivot and change in view here in Nashville, Tennessee, in our Vanderbilt Medical Center, and for our health system in general, to be able to answer the challenge of COVID? Next slide. Well, early in 2020, everybody's aware of the fact that it swept the world from China to across the continent, beginning in the United States and Washington State, those early infestations in the, in the nursing homes. 
uh, in the chronic facilities really made the case that COVID was uniquely able to affect people that had immune problems, the aged, people with diabetes, hypertension, coronary disease, vascular disease, these things lead to immune deficiencies acquired. Your immune system is not quite as robust with these conditions and you are therefore more susceptible to infections, COVID and otherwise for that matter. And so we saw it sweep across to the Northeast and all of a sudden we turned around, next slide, and it was landing here in Nashville. Uh, next, next slide. So it showed here uh, in, a, in a few cases and then began to expand in numbers of cases here in Nashville. Um, and at the time it was apparent that at least initially, uh, the data from the health department, which was really poorly sourced, was primarily data that occurred uh, in the health department and in our major medical centers and physician offices, not in our communities where we have issues with access to care whether it be here in North Nashville, South Nashville, parts of East Nashville. So the initial reports of the preponderance of cases in our white population was, was actually somewhat correct, but, but mostly in error because it missed the fact that it was occurring in our minority populations, but more importantly, our minority populations were the ones struck with the disease and higher rates, also higher issues about mortality and morbidity because of the cluster of those comorbid medical conditions that we see that's extant in our minority communities here. So we saw this occurring in Vanderbilt and, you know, typically, you know, we look at responding things based on our core missions around and drivers about diversity and inclusion being intentional, discover, learn, and share. We're very much a research level university and we need to design our response to things based on patients and families' needs. The problem was we, our emergency command center had been put together for tornadoes, the flood in 2010, the tornadoes in early in the 2010 area and, and, and the time and shootings. And you know, we were really, really set for that, but we really had not thought about what, the, what that center needed to look like if you faced a medical pandemic as we faced here in the city. Next slide. So we had to, whoops, <laughs> back, uh, back a few, keep going back, keep going back, oh, back, whoa, whoa. We're almost there, whoa. Let's see, uh, go back one, let's see. Yeah, now four here. So we, we recognize that there was a real issue in the way our, uh, our command center was structured is that it did not have uh, people who had knowledge or insight around health system deficiencies, which we're seeing playing out here in North Nashville and in Antioch and in our in our, in our communities where we have uh, learning, uh, English is not the primary language. And so also our system was not really, didn't have the infrastructure in place for health equity. And, and recognize the issues of health equity and minority health disparities have been around and, uh, and addressed in great uh, detail in, in 1985 in the Margaret Heckler Report under the Ronald Reagan of all administrations, the Margaret Heckler Report, his HHS secretary pointed out for the first time got the data, disaggregated data that showed that health disparities were real, that black people died at higher rates from heart attacks, had higher, deeper strokes, worse strokes, and higher, higher mortality, our higher rates of diabetic complications. So these things were already present in our communities. And we began to see how COVID began to shine a spotlight on these and, mag and bring these to fore because it's those clusters of comorbidities that led to the higher rates of, of hospitalizations and death in those communities. Next slide. So we had to change, whoop, <laughs> back, back one a little bit there, back one, there you go. So we had to merge our strategic directions on, we had to think about designing and changing how we thought about our command center. We had to use our Vanderbilt research mindset in our, in our Vanderbilt in, uh, IT infrastructure to kind of adjust the command center and pivot. So we had to merge this. Next slide. Jim, there you go, easy, great. And so we morphed and not to just a command center for tornadoes, but to a COVID command center. And we had to bring those interprofessional teams in that normally weren't members of that command center. So we brought in a health equity team led by Consuelo Wilkins, former head of the Harry Vanderbilt Alliance. They brought my office in when I was head of diversity affairs there. And we brought in recognizing other key, light, key allied health professionals, our health literacy teams. 
our nursing teams, our social service teams, and we had created an employee affinity groups of Vanderbilt employees who come from our minoritized populations here in Nashville that had access to knowledge about who were the real trusted leaders in those communities that we could send messages to. Next slide. So that, that command team looked different. We had to add, so it had the usual, as they say in Casablanca, the usual suspects were on the team. We had the leader there. We had communication, supply chain people, manpower, nursing power, the lab team leaders were there, occupational health, but the, an infection obviously control was there. But we didn't have health equity and health diversity till we embedded it in that team. It became very clear. And what's even important is that that was a lesson learned by the medical center's leadership to recognize that health equity doesn't need to just be in here for a pandemic, but it need to be broadly, deeply inculcated and in, in placed within the confines of pretty much everything we do every day in the medical center, because those health disparities didn't just come and go away with COVID, they still remain and are quite evident. So we began to replace Consuelo there with, with the rest of the team members, and, and that team began to work throughout the whole Vanderbilt integrated health system, whether it be the, uh, the medical center, the outside clinics, the Vanderbilt County Hospital, and others. Next slide. <gasps> Go back. <laughs> that thing is sensitive. Next. There you go. Good. So, Conception Department brought us in. So what did we bring to the table? Well, from the work that Dr. Wilkins had done here at Meharry Vanderbilt Alliance and her work with her team, they had a lot of community health assessment work, uh, needs assessment that had been going on for years here in Nashville, pointing out which communities, which zip codes had the higher rates of health disparities and more importantly would be more prone then for COVID infection. And through their work, she had over 100 community-based organizations that she had con connections with through the Meharry Vanderbilt Alliance work and therefore could then find out who were those trusted community partners and recognize for the first time helping our community, our Vanderbilt community leadership understand that trusted partners aren't really just a Vanderbilt professor with a tenure track and a big title. People in our communities, whether it be Antioch, North Nashville, whether, wherever it might be, they're gonna listen more too because of the problems that black people have had with uh, research level universities of not having trust. The concerns of being used in research uh, experiments that goes back, obviously back to the Tuskegee issue with syphilis has still been a, a concern that is deeply embedded in our uh, black neighborhoods. So we had to turn to those trusted community partners, the barbers, the hairdressers, the community leaders, the religious leaders. And so with those identified and recognized, and that's something that uh, Professor and uh, Pro President Hildreth also made very clear in his remarks too. And so that, that, that was a new paradigm for many white medical centers, not just Van, but across the country, whether it be UPenn or others to recognize you have to reach into those communities and find those. You needed to know who they were, those trusted community partners that people would listen to, to go get tested, to go to the centers that have been placed here in North Nashville, go to, and get treatment when the vaccines became available. In my office, we had developed these research, these employee resource groups, or, uh, employee resource groups that included African-American resource group, Hispanics, resource group, LGBTQI, AAPI, because what was phenomenal about those resource groups is that they were portable portals to those vulnerable populations. They had the access points, the knowledge points, once again, where they touch either the medical treatment and nursing nurses in those communities or the trusted community leaders. And we also in our group had within our knowledge the, the chronic and acute psychosocial model that we understand that that's really present in African-American communities, the chronic stress model of what racism does to your immune system, how racism and its influences can affect stress hormones and, and predispose you to a lot of the medical conditions that are higher rates in our communities, such as diabetes, obesity, hypertension, and the like. And we also had a deeper appreciation of social determinants of health to influence healthcare and outcomes. Next slide. Ah, got it, there you go. So we recognize that, this is my drawing, that, that boy, a lot of things determine your outcome, your mortality, your survival, your health care in a hospital or medical system before you even re reach the door. The location where you live. You're, are you in a poverty in, uh, environment? Are you in a, in, a, in a food desert? Are you in a condition uh, where there's high uh, crime rates, lack of social support, pollution? and the like, and just having minority status alone uh, and the issues about being black in America 
uh, being welcomed into the into medical centers and, and hospitals, and not just in Nashville, but around the country. And see, at the point of care, then you have the other issues around bias, both conscious and unconscious bias, that then play a role in terms of how you how care is delivered to people who are different from our, uh, our white uh, physicians uh, uh, in, in, in these hospital systems across the country. And the knowledge that unconscious bias produces barriers and the knowledge that people, that language can produce barriers. The health literacy issues have to be addressed in terms of the things that we're giving patients to read and try to explain the issues. And then of course, after the care, or during the care, did they get the right diagnosis? The right medicines was, was follow-up arranged. And all those things then lead to healthcare outcomes that we see. Uh, that play out uh, for people from minoritized communities. Sicker, loss of productivity, lost wages, earlier death. So these are things that those of us that work in the health equity, health disparities, uh, diversity, inclusion, and equity area already were aware of. And we recognize as we watched this play out in Nashville and other places around the country, how this was magnified by the influence of COVID this unique virus which, in which we didn't have a, in, immediately any ready treatments for in those early days other than physical distancing and masks. And so we saw that play out in, in terrible uh, scenarios here in Nashville and across the country. Next slide. So, uh, so how do we do this? Well, we had met in the bowels of the hospital. They created this big old room where we met twice a day. We had, using our IT, we created unique dashboards and made them disaggregate the data based on zip code, uh, language proficiency, uh, age, uh, race, ethnicity. And with that, we began to see these issues of specific groups who are more susceptible to getting COVID infection and also morbidity and mortality. Uh, and we began using the real data that you're quite familiar with, disaggregated data around race, ethnicity and language. Uh, next slide. Gently. <laughs> uh, keep going. Back one more. I think that might be it. Go back one more. Yeah. Okay, go forward. Just yeah, forward. There you go. Uh, nope. yeah. one, one more. Yeah. There you go. So we started pulling data, looking at zip code data in uh, 37013 and general metropolitan data. Uh, you know, the metropolitan national area is about a million, two million people. And we know the breakdowns in terms of percentages. But in those zip codes that we, that we started seeing higher rates of issues, there were higher numbers of African Americans in, those, in that zip code, higher, rate, higher numbers of Hispanics percentage wise. We saw that the median income was less. There were more foreign born. Uh, hospital uh, household sizes were a little bit larger and more people were below the poverty line. We start seeing those higher number of COVID cases occurring in those zip codes. And those zip codes were in Antioch around here and other uh, places where we had clusters of uh, either African-American, Hispanic, or, or, uh, or actually foreign born, uh, uh, with immigrants who are now living here in Nashville. Uh, next slide. This data we're showing here, whoa, this data, go back, this data we're showing here, uh, yeah, go back, right there, uh, is from the, a paper we wrote in the New England Journal of Medicine. Dr. Wilkins uh, was the primary uh, writer in the, uh, of this. Uh, we pulled together all the data that we saw uh, in the early days uh, of COVID. This was probably a paper that came out in 2021 in the early, and maybe the May, May or March of 2021 uh, that actually looked at that data, actually January, and it pulled the data in those early months where we're really learning about COVID. And so we started seeing the kind of things that, that, that Jim uh, uh, Hildreth talked about. And if you look at the within group po uh, positive SARS tests, we start seeing these disproportionate findings of more African-American percentage-wise within our population, more Hispanic positivity, Asian, American Indian within those populations. But what was really striking, if you had something, a language other than English, look at the rates of positive tests within those communities and then significantly look at uh, uh, those that had spoke Spanish, Arabic, uh, Nepal. So, so we see within 
a minority community specifically uh, that uh, those socioeconomics of health that, that have been extant and present for years that have led to less access to care, less likelihood they would seek care because of concerns of trust, less likely to seek care because of uh, income, making a decision between going to work or going to a clinic, uh, getting a medicine or feeding your family. So all the kind of tough choices that we have seen for years play out in our minority uh, populations that are present in these cities began to be quite evident and kind of magnified within and even more impressive, we could start seeing the lack of English proficiency. So it started making the case that that the that the that a growing group that we needed to be paying even more attention to were the foreign born, the immigrants that are coming here from uh, the Middle East and across uh, the world here, landing in those communities with less access for medical care. And and so we we see that the, the social determinants health doesn't really care so much about your race and ethnicity; it cares about where you live and what your income levels are and your access to care. Just so happens we see the disproportionate number of that within our people of color and people from foreign status. Next slide. So, so with this, next slide, I'm sorry. So with this, uh, we began, the data began uh, being pushed out to the health department. There were, my goodness, uh, television reports or meetings pretty much all the time held by Alex Jangier, who was the lead on this from the National Department of Health, uh, we had a coming together amazingly of very competitive hospital systems uh, to being sitting around those tables every day down in the health department, getting our data coming out of Vanderbilt and others uh, sh being shared equally and creating uh, systems of response to care, uh, not tied to economics at this point, but tied to what's the right thing to do for Nashville. It was really, really one of the most amazing things that I, I've seen happen but maybe that speaks to the to the uh, to the geniality and the nature of living in a in a southern town like Nashville, uh, the coming together. And uh, but what was evident quite early on, is, as many of you know, is that we weren't we didn't have the testing sites here in North America. We didn't have the testing sites in Antioch. It really took the push of people like Jim Hilbert, as well as Alex Janger in the health department, who began seeing those clusters of cases with higher rates in Antioch. They began to push them to put the monitoring units here at Meharry and around the city in our most needed areas here. So real-time get, 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 uh, data gathering took place, look at all, almost 50,000 people tested in Vanderbilt. Uh, and what we learned, we actually learned all kinds of stuff. We learned that actually we knew Spanish was one of the most important and you know, highly spoken languages. We didn't know Arabic was number three. So English, Spanish, and Arabic are the most uh, spoken languages, uh, readily spoken languages here in Nashville. And we also really had to come to grips with the fact that most of our health literacy material was way off. It didn't have the right language for people, obviously, who are from Nepal or from the Middle East. And the literacy le uh, level was too high. Most of our patients, even in our hospital clinics, the grade level is less than, you know, eighth grade. So we had to really pivot and begin to create with our health literacy team a lot more either uh, videos uh, and also material that was that was pitched with the right language and also at the right uh, literacy level. And we began to invest, the medical center invest a few million dollars into health equity programs, investing in those town halls and social media. And, uh, and our employee resource groups from all of our marginalized communities were very effective in pointing us to those trusted community members that would allow us to deliver the right messages about screening and treatment and care. And so there was a lot of learning done real time and on the fly as we worked through this. And we also had to come to grips uh, around the country that, that our healthcare workers, health, that our people who worked in the kitchen, who, who take care of our rooms that, who are disproportionately African-American in this city and across the country should be viewed as healthcare workers because they're essential workers. They were exposed. They couldn't stay home on their Zoom calls as many physicians or administrative leaders were. They had to be at work. So they were at risk and many, in many cases were uh, contracting COVID at rates higher than, uh, than their colleagues who could work from home, which would make sense, obviously. So we had to change and pivot that we now call 
uh, those uh, amazing folks that, that came to work every day and, and delivered for us, part of our healthcare team. They definitely uh, have been viewed and, and have been uh, appropriately uh, uh, titled and labeled as, as members of our healthcare team. Uh, ne next slide there. Oops, it's okay, go back. <laughs> yeah, so, so now what did we learn? Well, I think we learned a number of things. We learned that as a city, Nashville could pivot and work together. Uh, we could drop the swords of, of competition for patients and healthcare dollars and recognize that there's something bigger than, there's a bigger issue than just that that will affect the healthcare and survival of many members of our community who are, who, who are not connected directly to healthcare, who are suffering from the social determinants of health. It was very remarkable to see that. And there, the Nashville Health Council that still exists is a great example of where that, that team of uh, hospital leaders are still meeting and, and dealing with issues within our community. So, so that was a useful thing. In the case of Vanderbilt, it began, we began to use institutional funds to build a health equity program. So we now have an Office of Health Equity that's fully funded uh, that actually has now not just worked on COVID, now it's pivoting and looking internally about health equity in a broad way within the confines of the medical center. What does that look like in terms of senior administrative staff diversity, women, women diversity in our senior administrative, pushing uh, the issue of resident diversity even more than we've been doing, looking at wage equity across the board. Uh, should we use resources within Vanderbilt to, to look at issues with respect to education of our employees who are coming from a lower economic rung. And so a whole host of things are, are occurring in the wake of this work that I think uh, speak to the fact that we learned a lot and, and we are appropriately pivoting to deal with and to include health equity, not just in the emergency, but as part of the day-to-day -day work within a large academic medical center. And we're not unique in that, that's occurring at Harvard Med School, my old med school is occurring at Penn, occurring at UCSF in San Francisco. And then uh, the health equity goals should be part of system goals and part of the organizational structure, as I mentioned, of, of a med academic medical center. And that real data has to always be used. Uh, disaggregated, aggregated data that just says we've got this many people that are having this illness or this problem is of very little use in a city that's becoming so multi-ethnic and so multinational and racial as Nashville. You have to have disaggregated data and it has to be even drilled down to the level of zip codes, as we're saying, because we do know this zip code is one of the highest rates of hypertension and hypertensive related stroke in the country or world are coming through this part of, of Nashville that we're sitting in here, here, here in North Nashville. And so you have to have real data and the data has to be disaggregated and broken apart. And then lastly, uh, there needs to be a closer connection between the health systems and the health departments, both the state and the local level. And we have seen that occur. And so there are more meetings, there's more connectivity, connective tissue, if I have to use that word, between Vanderbilt and Meharry and Ascension and uh, the other health systems back to uh, the health department uh, so that we all know what we need to know so that if we have another, unfortunately, hopefully not, calamity that takes place and has, a, and has health imp implications, we'll be in a much better spot to be able to pivot and be able to answer that. So those are the really big lessons I wanted you to, to hear from me about this. And the other aspects as I close, that's really important, that, that comes back around to the interprofessional, interdepartmental importance of this. There's no way in the world that this call to answer this problem could have been solved by just physicians alone. It required social scientists, it required our epidemiologists, it required deeper dives in uh, support in terms of getting uh, our epidemiology and our infectious disease teams in the field. It required more intimate knowledge of community structure and community organizational structure. And so those are things that the old model of the physician with the bag going to the hospital house to take care of uh, the patient and the farm is still a very important model, but the modern model in the, in the modern 21st century city, such as Nashville is, a large expanding uh, metropolis, is that to take care of patients that, that, that now arrive at the door of our hospital, hospitals and medical centers, it requires a team. I don't do anything 
pretty much it. I'm a cardiologist. Uh, I probably send messages to my cardiac pharmacist all the time, maybe four or five times a day. I'll send, send her a note and say, Lori, what about this drug interaction issue? Or can I use this drug as a patient who's 80 years of age, who's on these meds, he has them all. And boy, I'm, I'm, I know I'm delivering better care than I had you know, 10, 20 years ago because the ready response, you know, ready response is the more important reducing the possibility of drug interactions or drug toxicities uh, has just been remarkable. And then to have the pharmacists rounding on the team in the wards is, is remarkable as well as the social services team there so that you're already are planning what the next steps need to be in, in an outpatient setting with patients, not waiting to the day of discharge. So I think the, the whole uh, paradigm on modern care, though it's very technology driven now, we have precision medicine, we have the use of DNA and electronic health records to really, really deliver the specific treatment for a specific patient based on their DNA and their susceptibility. But on a larger context, it's still the macro care that's delivered by a multi-specialty team that brings in everyone. And the, and the thing I teach everybody about this is based on the situation, I may not be the leader of that team. If the problem is right now, the patient's having a myocardial infarction and not sure to what should be the next steps, then my team will pivot and I'll be the head. But if we're moving towards discharge and I don't know where this patient needs to go and can go and what medications will their insurance cover, I'd let the pharmacists and, the, and our social uh, services people step to the lead and I'm, I, become an, uh, I become a student. Uh, I become a supporter rather than the lead of the team. So as we train our next generation of physicians and, phys and nurse practitioners and physician associates to all our clinicians now, our clinician teams, we have to build in this humility, anti-hubris, and a strong appreciation is that leadership might need to change hands in the course of complex care that patients face now. And so that is really an important message that I'd like to end with. And I'll certainly leave it now for any questions that might come forth. Hope that was helpful. Uh, and if Patricia is here, if she wants me to finish, uh, I'll be in Rose. I have a few minutes. I can do that. <laughs> she sent her regards. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> she did send her regards. <laughs> I second that because I also did send her a message and tell her that you even used those wonderful vocal cords and she smiled via and said, okay, <laughs> please send my regards. <laughs> That's great. Doctors have to use everything. I think uh, the modern uh, physicians don't recognize that to cross, cross the patient chasm, which, was, which you only have 10 minutes to do with a new patient, you better bring everything you've got to the fore to try to connect across. And uh, I actually do sing to patients, believe it or not. It does help. Oh, really? Yeah. Questions out there, please. Man, the, 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 you got a huge team here. Yeah, Great. A lot of today. folks came on. Yeah. I'm checking the chat box. If you have any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat or just raise your hand and I will un, uh, have uh, Mr. Fleming unmute you. No such thing as a stupid question or a silly question. All questions are valid. Ron, can I ask? Dr. Ramesh, you can go. Yeah. Um, good afternoon, Dr. Churchill. Um, thank you very much for giving an excellent uh, talk. Uh, being a former patient of uh, uh, your brother and also was seen by you one time when I was- I'm, I am so sorry you saw Keith, that's too bad, yeah. <laughs> yeah, when, when I was in the Vanderbilt <laughs> and- uh, uh, my question is, have you seen any uh, preponderance of uh, cardiovascular problems uh, in patients having COVID, either valve issues or uh, cardiac muscle-related issues or uh, uh, arrhythmia and all those? Thank you. Well, that's really a great question because we're still, you know, we're, we're not finished with COVID. We're still learning. It's almost like building the... Uh, the building while you're trying to live in it or building the ark while you're trying to float it. We're still learning and gathering data. There's a host of things. There are things that we have found uh, in some incidental reports and, and in some uh, accumulative case reports that are really astounding. I'll begin with COVID itself. From a cardiovascular point of view, we have seen uh, 
coronary thrombosis. COVID activates the thrombotic mechanism and can create a hypercoagulable state. And you and there have been patients that have presented to hospitals around the country with deep venous thrombosis, pulmonary embolism in the midst of a COVID attack that has required obviously to, to pivot and use anticoagulants. We also have seen patients that not just have um, pulmonary embolism with deep vein thrombosis, but arterial thrombosis. We had a young, had a gentleman who fallen for 20 years who developed COVID and came in the midst of a COVID with a left anterior descending acute thrombosis an acute myocardial infarction. There was no lesion in the coronary artery other than a clot once we evacuated the clot. There was no stenosis. It was purely a clot that formed there. He's doing well, thank the Lord, because he had collaterals. Uh, then we have seen cases of myocarditis. Now they are rare, but they do occur. As a matter of fact, we were the first center to publish uh, cases of myocarditis in athletes. Uh, we began uh, imaging every athlete who had COVID uh, with MRI, cardiac MRI, contrast MRI, and the rates of uh, COVID, uh, finding COVID, uh, finding myocarditis on an MRI in patients with COVID was really low. It was like less than maybe 10% and, and very rare to be symptomatic uh, from this. And now the key is to follow it out, how long, uh, most of the ejection fractions were normal, how much do they wind up with fibrosis and scar? How much do they wind up with late arrhythmias you know, maybe four, five, six months down the line, that's to be told. But athletes can get myocarditis from this, and if they get it, they can't exercise. Uh, there are a lot of old data on mouse models, uh, murine mouse models of myocarditis, that if you exercise a mouse in the midst of acute myocarditis, the heart is distorted. They don't recover. The ejection fraction doesn't recover. The exercise itself increases the load on the heart. The heart enlarges ejection fraction drops. So when they, we find myocarditis in any, any athlete, young person, we have to shut them down in terms of the, the playing of sports and the like, you know, for at least, uh, at least two months before we actually relook at everything. Um, then we've seen some really, uh, we've seen pericarditis, not just myocarditis, pericarditis. And we've also seen some unusual things occurring with the vaccines. And patients who receive vaccines, we've actually had people develop vaccine-related myocarditis, because it is, a, is an antigen. And we've seen people develop myocarditis uh, post-COVID uh, uh, vaccine. That's even rarer, thank goodness, than the myocarditis from COVID. We also have seen both with COVID and with the vaccine a uh, form of dysautonomia. People who, in the, in the midst of COVID, who, had, who were normal tensive, now they have spikes to 200 or pulse of 30. Uh, most of those people, thank goodness, recover. Uh, it may take, we have a woman that took three to four months to, before her autonomic uh, nervous system became normalized again. That can be a real challenge. Uh, people are having syncope because their pressures are just dropping. Uh, so it's almost like Guillain Barre in terms of autonomic insufficiency like that. So it's a really complicated disorder. I think we're still learning and gathering data. There's certainly arrhythmias. We've seen atrial fibrillation. We've seen, uh, we haven't seen, uh, we've seen some non-sustained and some ventricular tachycardia in the context of myocarditis. So I, I would say that uh, these are in the small fractions of percentages, praise God, because you don't see that occurring. All of us have family members who've had COVID and we don't see that. We do see some other post-long COVID issues that this autonomia thing can linger for months, that, that we see that it is a long COVID issue most long COVID prey is mostly related to uh, fatigue and muscle issues and, their, uh, the, and some of the worst cases are uh, persistent pulmonary uh, respiratory insufficiency for sure. Thank you, sir. Yeah, so my little brother Keith is now president of Yale New Haven Hospital. He's, he's found this really low paying job uh, at Yale. So uh, he, he may need you to call him up. He might need a job in about another year or so. <laughs> somebody's <laughs> lost is somebody's gain. <laughs> Oh my goodness. brother Kevin is president and CEO of Boston Children's up there at Harvard. So, the, so those, those young, young, young guys are doing okay. Now the All right. At this time, I'm going to uh, check the chat one more time. I don't see any questions. Um, so I will turn it back over to Mr. Ross Fleming. And thank you for that phenomenal uh, presentation. We always learn a lot when you're present. So thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Brown. Uh, can you see, you can look in the same chat box um, um, that I have, correct? Are there no questions there? 
I don't see any questions. Just someone said thank you. Okay. Okay. Um, thank you, Dr. Church. Please. I will. I will say this. I will. I will take a point of of personal privilege that I don't normally do, but we do have um, AHEC scholars and residents on, yes. and I will say you should never have a speaker like Dr. Churchwell and not have any questions because uh, he is a thought leader, a content expert, and a wealth of knowledge. So there should always be at least two questions that that come. So I, I'm very shocked that we don't have, have any questions. And so um, it's not every day that we have him here. So um, I just want to mention that, Mr. Fleming, and that's just a point. Sure, of and, and th th thank you, Dr. Brown. And, and Ross, feel free if questions show up later, I have then you can email them, to, you can email them to me. Yes, yes, doctor. I find it very interesting that when I go to different places like Kroger's and so forth, the glass shield that was there, now down, yeah. the employees are not wearing masks, but all indications is that we'll see an increase in the winter COVID this winter. That's correct. So, can you touch on that? I, you know, it's human nature. The human nature is, is to return to normal as soon as you can, to uh, and and to disavow uh, the potential problems uh, that can occur with this. I think they've seen this with influenza. We've seen it back in the, the initial uh, 1900. Uh, pandemic, uh, similar virus. They saw very uh, with a, uh, influenza, same type of thing. There is this rush in human nature to want to return to the normal without recognizing, you know, when I go out, I'm wearing a mask when I go in the Kroger's. Uh, I, uh, you know, my, uh, I've had all my boosters and everything, but I got COVID uh, at my brother Keith's daughter's wedding in Northern California in San Francisco in a small gathering. Thank goodness with the boosters, I just had a sinusitis for three days. But, you know, it is still evident. Uh, we just got back from a wedding in Miami, Palm Beach. My niece got married and like four or five members of the family have COVID. Uh, someone was a carrier down there who had not been treated. And so I would say you're absolutely right, Doc, that uh, when you're out in public uh, I would, and in crowds and traveling, I would definitely wear the K95 or N95, those are the only ones that really are worth anything. The cloth mask, the regular surgical mask is okay, but it's only 70% effective. The K95, the N95s are much closer to 90 plus percent successful in filtering that virus. Thank you, Dr. Burns, for that question. Uh, are there any other questions at this time for Dr. Churchwell? Please speak up at this time. I, I, yeah, you'll see side effects with COVID after, even with having the... I don't think we we're, we have enough data, but uh, we still will see some long COVID in people who, who recover from COVID who've been boosted. And we definitely will see that and have seen that too, as a matter of fact. The question is, if you've been boosted and had, uh, will you have less incidence of long COVID? We don't know the answer to that one yet. Yeah, don't have an answer. Yeah. At this time, if you do have a question, please unmute and um, state your question at this time. Nice. Well, take care. So thank feel free you, to yeah, reach Dr. out. Churchill. Thank you, Dr. Churchill. Thank you, Mr. Ross, and thank you, Dr. Brown. Thank you, Dr. <laughs> Churchwell, for accepting our invitation. Absolutely. This one. And we will invite you back. Anytime. We will try to schedule a little better. There you <laughs> go. No problem. <laughs> Next time. <laughs> uh, really, thank you for coming out. Absolutely. Uh, we do not have the evaluation at this time. I will email it out to everyone. Um, I'm going to make sure I have uh, Dr. Not doctor, but uh, Natasha Yokely's um, list of email addresses to mail out to her scholars, as, as well as everybody else that was on the call. So uh, if there's nothing else, thank you for coming and uh, stay tuned for November 15th for Dr. Um, who's coming next in, in November? <laughs> Dr. Birdsaw. Dr. Quincy Birdstone from Lipscomb University. I almost yeah, forget. Almost right, yeah, I know Quincy. Good speaker. Yeah, he'll be here. Yeah, yeah okay? he's a good one. So thank you, everyone. And have a great night. Take care. Big turnout there. Yeah.